you were actually one of the people to ask a question to the former president at this Economic Club of New York event, and you asked about the deficit. Yes. He proposed not only making his 2017 tax cuts permanent, he also proposed lowering those corporate taxes to 15 percent. In this scenario, how concerned are you about the U.S. deficit? I'm not that concerned because the, the reduction in corporate taxes was just for a segment of the corporate population and it concerned those that are involved in U.S. manufacturing. Uh, overall, currently we have about a $2 trillion deficit under the current administration. So uh, President Trump feels confident that could be reduced several ways. One is, is through the revenue earned from tariffs, which could be substantial. Two is by cutting wasteful spending. The most important uh, item he alluded to was the Green New Deal, which over time adds up to somewhere around a trillion in spending. And the third is not providing federal benefits to illegal immigrants. So net-net, these, these revenue generation and savings uh, will offset um, any minor adjustments to the tax code. But the way that it worked out in the past, right, you have the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, you have the Tax Foundation, the Congressional Budget Office, all saying that the Trump tax cuts would actually cost more than $10.5 trillion dollars over a decade, which means that all of the tax cuts proposed really don't add up to really filling in the hole from the tariffs that he recommends. Yeah, I haven't seen those particular studies. I, I really don't know what they're referring to. So at the end of the day as well, how do you think that he could really gather the American populace, the American worker that has become so important in this election cycle with a recommendation of cutting ca taxes on corporations rather than helping out the American worker. Yeah, I, I don't think he said he would cut taxes generally against corporations. He's not raising taxes. What he wants to do is make his previous tax policy permanent and leave the basic corporate tax rate at 21 percent. The tax uh, cuts that he proposed target uh, the Americans that would need it most. Uh, one is, is, is well known now, no tax on tips which would be a great benefit to service workers and allow them to keep more of their income. Uh, second was not taxing Social Security benefits. So uh, many people rely on Social Security benefits for, for most of their income. So that could be a very significant help in the after-tax earnings of recipients. Let's take a step back and also ask just a broader question here. You have obviously been a very large supporter of the former president in this cycle. What underpins your faith in him? Well, uh, first of all, his policies, which under his administration were very successful. Uh, while people or these studies referred to are concerned about potential inflation or deficits, under his four years, the average annual inflation was only 1.9 percent. Interest rates were very low and oil prices were very low. And real wages for the average worker increased under the Biden administration, which uh, is supposed to be for the average worker, real wages declined because inflation was so high. Uh, interest rates are much higher and oil prices are much higher. So when you look at the benefits four years under Trump or four years under Biden, the average American has done much better under Trump. I do have a question about the energy policy as well, because he did say today that oil yep. production will increase. He said fourfold if he takes office again. But the U.S. is already producing more oil than ever, and the surplus oil could end up being sold overseas. And it's very unlikely that companies will drill more at this point in time. Why spend so much money on this policy? I don't think Trump would be spending money. He said that he would release federal a lands for more drilling, uh, that he would reduce regulations and reduce the current moratorium on permitting new LNG facilities. So that would be a boon to U.S. production and a boon for U.S. exports. So exporting energy is very positive for our economy. I would love for you to also hone in here on some of the commentary that was made this week. You may have seen that Goldman Sachs 
analysts had said that economic output could take a hit under a future Trump administration. They said, and I'm quoting their report, that the hit to growth from tariffs and tighter immigration policy would outweigh the positive fiscal impulse. What do you say to them? I think the, the uh, immigration policy is a, uh, a negative for our economy. If you look at New York City, we have hundreds of thousands of immigrants which are, are costing the economy valuable resources that existing taxpayers are paying for. So we have to provide uh, health care benefits, housing benefits, food benefits, and these workers aren't allowed to work. So I, I don't think the illegal immigration has been a benefit to American workers. It increased the supply of cheap labor, which held down wage growth for American citizens. So wage growth has been part of the inflationary story, has it not? Um, wage growth has been grown less than inflation. That's why real wages have declined. I also want to talk about interest rates. Because at the end of the day, there has been a lot of concern on Wall Street about what a Trump administration would mean when it comes to the Federal Reserve. There was, of course, that Wall Street Journal report a number of months ago that questioned whether the Federal Reserve would remain independent. And then we also had the former president commenting in an interview with Bloomberg as well, saying that the president can certainly be talking about interest rates because he has good instincts. That doesn't mean he's calling the shot, but it does mean he should have a right to talk about it like anyone else. Do you share that concern that he could potentially damage the reputation of the Federal Reserve as an independent organization? No, I don't share that concern. I think it is important for the President and the White House and the Treasury to Secretary to comment on economic policy, including interest rate policy. But ultimately, the decision is up to the Fed. But it's important for the Fed to hear uh, other viewpoints and to make sure the Fed policies in sync with overall fiscal policy. To that end, what do you believe should happen with interest rate policy through the end of this well, year? Well, when you look next? at inflation now is, is somewhere around 3 percent. Interest rates are 5 percent. So real interest rates are too high. So the Fed, I think, waited too long to bring interest rates down. So I think the likely course of action is going forward is the Fed will start to cut interest rates. What should they be by the end of 2025? It's difficult to predict, but my best guesstimate would be around 3 percent, perhaps 2.5 percent. And what would that mean in terms of ripple effects across the economy? Well, it's generally beneficial. The major cost when you get a mortgage is the interest rate. So if, mortgage, if, if the cost of mortgages come down, the cost of buying a home would also come down, and that makes uh, housing affordability go up and uh, you know that would spur uh, new housing development. So another thing that the former president had tried to do in office the last time around was privatize Fannie Freddie. Is that something you think he would be able to accomplish or is talking about accomplishing in a potential um, next term? I think it makes sense. The, the intention of the conservatorship was to temporarily uh, uh, put Fannie and Freddie in conservatorship while they built up their capital. Initially, all the earnings of Fannie and Freddie were swept out by the government. But uh, after Steve Mnuchin left office, he no longer allowed that policy, and the, and the uh, GSEs have been rebuilding capital. So they're, not, they're now at a position that where they're fairly well capitalized which would make privatization logical. I do have to ask you the one thing that he mentioned you very directly about also in the course of his speech today, which was that there is an idea about an American sovereign wealth fund. How realistic is that idea, and how much have you built out that idea with the former president? Well, we haven't flushed it out, but clearly savings within a country are a measure of a country's strength. So you have countries like Norway, uh, the Middle East, to the Asian countries, have very large sovereign wealth funds. And I think that's a good model to follow. So you have to start somewhere. So I think the idea of a sovereign wealth fund for American savings is a good one. Who else is involved in a kind of conversation like that? We haven't discussed it in detail at this point. And how big could it be at the onset? Well. You know, you look at the Norwegian fund, it's over a trillion dollars, well over a trillion. Uh, Saudi Arabia has, has 
very large funds. Abu Dhabi has large funds. So it would be great to see America join this party and instead of having debt, had savings. Of a trillion dollar sovereign wealth fund. Well, it would be over time larger than any existing funds.